Christ Community Church, located at 25th and Thomas Avenue in Portsmouth, Ohio. Well, good morning, Christ Community Church. Good to see you all. Hope you had a good week. It was a good and busy week for me, and I felt really good last week because I was I've got a major presentation uh, for my program, my doctoral program on Thursday. Um, have to present a paper for 50 minutes to an hour, and then two hours of Q&A from the professor and, and fellow students. And so I was preparing for that, and I go to check the mail, and I got called to jury duty. Oh. Um, so I report tomorrow morning for jury duty. I don't expect I'll last very long. No self-respecting lawyer wants another lawyer on their jury. Um, and especially because it looks like from the questionnaire I filled out that uh, it's a criminal case and certainly nobody wants uh, a def no defense attorney wants a guy who started his legal career as a prosecutor on the jury. So hopefully I'll get tossed quickly and I can get back to work, but uh, we shall see. I remember a guy years ago, local businessman who will remain nameless, uh, we were talking about jury duty and he said, you know how to get out of jury duty? And I said, I'm, I'm all ears. He said, no matter what question they ask you, doesn't matter. Always end your answer with, in accordance with the prophecy. Is your name Matthew R. Rawlings? Yes, in accordance with the prophecy. Gone. If I have to pull that out, I might. Um, so we are going to, in the next couple of weeks, wrap up the book of Revelation. We'll be in chapter 21 uh, here in a minute. And so you may want to turn there. But before we get there, um, this next month in August, after we finish up uh, Revelation, what we're going to do is something we've done before, but we haven't done for a while, but a number of people have asked for it. I don't usually like to step away from books of the Bible, but every once in a while something like this is necessary. And so a couple people asked, are you ever going to do another Ask Pastor Matt, a, a, a Q&A, where you guys ask the questions and uh, you submit them, and I go and I answer them, any question on apologetics, Bible, theology, church history, whatever. And um, I said, uh, okay, so... Because I did not want to, and by the way, after we get through Labor Day, we're going to jump in to the Apostle Paul with both feet because, Lord willing, things can change, but Lord willing, we're going to spend about a year with the Apostle Paul. Uh, we're going to look at most of his letters, not all of them, but most of them. We'll look at um, Galatians which most scholars believe was the earliest letter of Paul we have, surviving letter. We'll look at First and Second Thessalonians. We'll look at First Timothy. We'll look at Romans. We'll look at Colossians, Philemon, Philippians, Ephesians, you know, over the next year. We're going to really dig into the Apostle Paul. But before we get there, we're going to do two weeks, and it's going to be two weeks because with this Q&A, and you'll, if you look in your bulletins, uh, if you took a bulletin, there's an insert in there. And the insert there is you can write down your question, don't have to sign it, um, just write down any question you have, and any time over the next couple weeks, today, next weekend, or the weekend after, you can take that question and put it back in one of the tithe kiosks back there, and we'll pick them up, I'll take them home, and I will answer as many as I have time to answer. Because right now I have seven questions already. And it's going to take at least five to ten minutes for each question. 
And, um, and I'll give them credit, the Saturday night crowd did not ask easy questions. So, which I'm proud of them, but, but you know, so we're gonna tackle those for a couple weeks. Then, uh, at the end of the month, beginning of the month, Dad will preach his anniversary, Christ Community Church anniversary uh, sermon because this September, Christ Community Church will be 54 years old. So he'll preach that, and then we dig into Paul. So that's where we're going, so you know. But let's look at Revelation 21. Let's recap before we get there. You may be sick of this, but it's, it's really, Revelation can, can, you know, there's so much nonsense out there about it. And, and by the way, you know, a couple people have come to me and said, have you seen what happens if you Google the book of Revelation? What you get, don't Google the book of Revelation. Do not. There's no filter on the internet, folks. Um, so what's happening is it's 64 A.D., roughly 32 to 34 years after Christ's resurrection. And Christ had said, he had told his disciples in Matthew 24, it's recorded in Matthew 24, and Mark 13, and Luke 21, he says, when they're all bragging on, the, his disciples are all bragging on how beautiful the temple is, how beautiful the temple structure is, how beautiful Jerusalem is, and, and Jesus says, within a generation, I'm going to tear all this down. And he said that around 30 A.D., a generation to the Jewish people was 40 years. In 70 A.D., it all was wiped out. And so now the time has come for that. It's 64 A.D., and Rome has been burned to the ground. About three-fourths of the city of Rome, the capital city of the empire, an empire that stretched from Great Britain all the way to the Middle East and all northern Africa. Rome is three-fourths of it burned to the ground. The people blamed the emperor, Nero. And he was to blame because he was to blame. Nero was a sociopathic narcissist. He murdered his own mother. He murdered both of his wives. He murdered one of his aunts. He actually, his second wife, he stomped to death while she was pregnant. Uh, Nero was a monster. The only people he seemed to like were those who applauded his terrible poetry and songs, and they were terrible, or the, Jew the Jewish people. He liked the Jewish people because basically the equivalent of a palm reader today told him that if he ever lost his throne in Rome, he would be king in Jerusalem. All of a sudden, he loves Jerusalem. So when the people started to blame him for the fire in Rome, and they got upset about it because tens of thousands of people died, Nero needed a scapegoat. So the synagogue leaders in Rome, who'd been, who had been persecuting the Christian church from day one, said, blame the Christians. And Nero said, good idea. Now, the temple leadership and the synagogues had been persecuting the Christian church from day one. Day one. They obviously put Jesus to death. They beat and imprisoned Peter and John. Just read the book of Acts. They stoned Stephen to death. Stephen was one of the first deacons in the church. They killed James, the brother of John. And then the Jewish historian Josephus says they put out a hit on Jesus' half-brother, James. They put a hit out on him because they did not want it to look like they had blood on their hands because Jesus' brother James was so popular in Jerusalem, they called him James the Just. But because he wouldn't shut up about his brother being the Christ, they had some mercenaries take him to the top of the temple and throw him off of it. Somehow he survived, despite the fact that every bone in his body was probably broken. So then, lying in a heap on the streets of Jerusalem, they stoned him to death. This was all coming down from the chief priest. Now when Jerusalem and the synagogues persecuted the early church, the early church had a place to run. They could go to the Roman Empire and say, help us. Especially Paul. 
when we get to Paul in September, we introduce you to the Apostle Paul, including some things you may not have known. One of the most, one of the things Paul possessed that so many people, probably 90% of the Roman Empire envied, was he had a little block of wood with a special inscription that said he was a citizen of Rome. He was a Roman citizen. And only citizens of Rome, and very few people had it. He was born into it, which meant he probably came from a very prominent and wealthy family in in the city of Tarsus, modern-day Turkey. With that block, whenever he showed it, he was guaranteed due process of law. If you and I were walking around Rome, we were not guaranteed due process. We could be imprisoned, beaten, and killed, and nobody would have raised any fuss about it. So, but when Nero decides to persecute the church and he designates the Christian church as the enemy of Rome, the church has no place to hide, nowhere to run, no security. John, the Apostle John, who's now probably in his 60s when he's writing this, has been exiled to the slave island of Patmos, where a quarry was, where you would be sentenced to hard labor. He's been exiled there. His home was in Ephesus. You can go to Ephesus today and see all kinds of places where church historians claim that's where John lived and all that kind of stuff. And so John, probably before the sun rises, is praying and worshiping God before he has to go to work. And all of a sudden, Jesus shows up. But not in the form that John was used to when he was walking around with him in Israel. He comes to him as the cosmic king. And he has a message for John. He says, I know what's happening, basically. I know your affliction, I know your trouble, but I walk among the lampstands. Now what does that mean? It means the lampstand stood for the churches. He said, I am in the churches. Any true church that really teaches God's word and has true faith in God is considered a lampstand in heaven and Jesus walks among them. If I'm doing my job right and your people's heart, if your heart's in the right place, Jesus is here. And he has a message, though, for the church. Despite all the hardships coming, and the persecution was nasty. He said, despite all that, in Revelation 2 and 3, he says, get your act together and repent. Repent of your sexual immorality. Repent of false teaching. And repent of your cowardice. But then, after he gives that message, he gives his people some hope. In chapter 4, we see God on his throne. And any time in Jewish thought, when they show God on his throne, that means God's in charge. He has not left. He's not gone on vacation. He rules and reigns, and he sees what's going on. And in chapter 5, we see Jesus as the lion lamb. The one who has conquered death. So the message is that God is allowing this. Now the question is, why would God allow such horrific persecution of his own people? It's because, first of all, unlike most of us, myself included, in my worst days, we tend to have a vision that extends probably no further than the next five minutes or the next five days. And so, if we're uncomfortable, we're in pain, we're unhappy. And we get mad at God. But God's vision is eternal. And so, You have to ask yourself that one of these days, whether you join Jesus in heaven or whether Jesus returns to join us here on earth, and we'll get to that in a second, 
and you have all eternity laid before you with no pain, no death, no suffering, no sin, and Jesus as king, what were these 70, 80 years of discomfort and pain compared to that? How many of you have heard the word martyr? Martyr? Okay. Martyr means a person who has suffered and is willing to die for their beliefs. That's a martyr. The word martyr, as we use it today, of so, say somebody like Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a pastor and a theologian in Nazi Germany. He refused to bend the knee to Hitler. He spoke out against Hitler. And his reward for being faithful to Jesus and refusing to recognize Hitler's reign, he was strung up naked with piano wire. But how do you think he feels about that today? The word martyr we use is a Greek word. It was a courtroom word. Christianity changed the meaning of that word because so many Christians were willing to suffer and die. Martyr means witness. Witness. What Jesus is calling this church to do is to be willing to suffer and die, to be a powerful witness for Jesus Christ. But then... In Revelation 6 through 18, what we see is Jesus saying two things. The two things you need to key in on in Revelation from 6 to 18 is that, one, Jesus says, I will judge your persecutors. They will not get away with this. And two, those of you who have suffered and died, even those of you who have been beheaded, you will join me in heaven in front of the throne of God. And then in chapter 19, we see Jesus execute that judgment. Historically, that judgment resulted in Nero forced to commit suicide, Rome being plunged into a year and a half bloody civil war, and Jerusalem being leveled. Then in 20, in 21 and 22, we get this strange thing that we have a hard time wrapping our heads around but first century Jews would not have had any problem getting this John goes from the future some of you've asked is where's where's the, is there any future or is this all about the first century no we're about to get to the future but he jumps back and forth in the first part of chapter 21, he's talking about the future when Jesus' return in the new heavens and the new earth, but then he'll jump back a few verses later and talk about the church here and now as it should be. It's both. It's back and forth. We'll see that in a second. So let's look at Revelation 21 while I put my old man lenses on. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. Now, what does that mean? It does not mean that in the new heavens and the new earth that there will not be a beach. Not that I care. I see all your pictures of you people mostly in the Atlantic Ocean. Let me say this because I love you as your pastor. I love you. You're idiots. The beach is the biggest marketing scam in the history of the world. If I came to you as a friend or a family member and I said to you, hey, I got an idea. Let's drive all night or Let's get on a Boeing plane and pray that the doors don't fly off. And let's go down and let's get into cold, murky water 
filled with jagged shells that you can cut yourself on, stinging jellyfish, man-eating creatures that may bite your leg off just to see how you taste, pollution, and fish poop. You go, are you nuts? But then I go, you want to go to the beach? Yay! It's the same thing! It's the exact same thing, guys. Hey, you come back with some weird infection and a chunk of you missing, I told you so. But that's not what's going on here. When he says there'll be no more sea, you need to understand that in Jewish thinking, going back to Genesis 1, 1, and 2, if you go back and read Genesis 1, 1, and 2, that the earth was formless and void, there was chaos, and it was covered in water. And of course, a few chapters later, you get God's judgment where the world is covered in water. So, to a Jewish mind in the first century, the sea represented chaos, evil, and judgment. And that's what John means is there's no more sea, no more chaos, no more evil, no more judgment. You see that? That's what he means. And I saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem, <coughs> coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle or dwelling of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will no longer be any death, and there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, They are done. This is the future, but God says it's done. It's done. Assured. Boom. Gonna happen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. Now, if it ended there, we'd all say amen, but the next verse is going to bite. The next verse is going to bite. He who overcomes or conquers, the Greek word is nakao, he who conquers will inherit these things. Now, throughout the book of Revelation, what does it mean to conquer? It means not to deny Jesus Christ even in the face of suffering and death. That's what he calls all of his true servants to do. He who overcomes will inherit these things. And I will be his God, and he will be my son. Now, notice this. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and vile. Now, that word there, translated vile or abominable or whatever your translation says, um, it's a Greek word that's not used very often. It's the Greek word is bedelusamai, bedelusamai. It typically is used to describe false religions and cults. False religions and cults. So the cowardly, the unbelieving, those who worship false gods or cults or whatever, and murderers and sexually immoral persons and sorcerers, that would include, that word includes people who claim to talk to the dead, palm readers, all, uh, tarot card readers, all that kind of nonsense. And idolaters, and all liars, I'm going to come back to that, and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, why on the one hand would he say, the vile, those who 
practice false religions, and then say, and idolaters. Isn't that the same thing? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. You can be an idolater and call yourself a Christian. Idolatry is placing anything, anything in primacy above God in your life. Anything. It could be a good thing. Marriage, children, work, money, looks, anything you place above your loyalty to God is idolatry. Anything. And I know that we all think that we're not idolaters. Okay? I've yet to have anybody take me up on this. Show me how you spend your free time and how you spend your money. I will show you your gods. Then one of the seven angels, who have the seven bowls, full of the seven last plagues, came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Who is the bride of Christ? Church. It's the church. In many ways, as Ken Gentry says in his commentary, and David Chilton in his commentary, in many ways the book of Revelation is a tale of two brides. Who was God's first bride? Israel. And he describes her as how? A harlot, unfaithful, an unfaithful bride. And so, despite the fact that God hates divorce, God divorces Israel and weds the church. So he's about to describe the church as it should be. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a precious stone, as a stone of crystal clear jasper. Now this is interesting, verse 12. It had a great and high wall. It had 12 gates, and at those gates, 12 angels. And names have been written on those gates, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel. There were three gates on the east, and three gates on the north, and three gates on the south, three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had twelve foundation stones, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Now, part of that is easy to understand. The church is built on what? The Old and New Testament. Right? Israel and the church. But why are there walls? Why are there gates? Those are defensive structures. You see, he's flipped back from the future to the present. And the one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its wall. And the city is laid out as a square, and its length is as great as the width. And he measured the city with the rod, 12,000 stadia. Its length and width and height are equal. If you don't think that this is symbolic, that's a giant cube, folks. And he measured its wall, 144 cubits, according to human measurements, which are also angelic measurements. And the material of the wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold, like pure glass. And the foundation stones of the city were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation stone was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each one of the gates was a single pearl, and the, city of the, and the streets of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. Why all of those gems to describe the church? Those gems 
were what the chief priest wore on his vest in the temple. So what is God saying? We are to now be the priests of God. And I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Now that's interesting, because our dispensational friends, and if you don't know what that means, our dispensational Christian brothers and sisters, those who buy into, you know, the secret rapture, the late great planet Earth, the left behind stuff, all that kind of stuff, um, one, part of that system is that the Jews have a track to heaven separate of apart from Jesus. That's not true. Jesus' own words say that. Two, they want to build a new temple. Back in the 80s, when they realized they could not build one in Jerusalem without causing World War III, they decided, I kid you not, they actually tried to raise money for this. Our dispensational friends, along with some Jews, tried to raise money to build a new temple in Florida. Don't ask me why. Let me ask you something. What was the purpose of the temple? Think about it for a second. The temple was the place where you went as a group to worship God. The temple was a place where you went to offer sacrifices to be made at one with God. Atonement means at one -ment with God. Do we need to make sacrifices anymore if we have faith in Jesus Christ? No. Hebrews makes this clear. Jesus is the once and for all sacrifice for all of our sins. There's no need for a temple anymore. And the city has no need of the sun or the moon or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it. And its lamp is the lamb. Now notice this. This is very interesting. And the nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be closed by day, for there will be no night there, and they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. And nothing defiled, and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, it says that the nations and the leaders of nations will come to this, to come to our... If this is talking about the future, this makes no sense. Because when Jesus returns, there will be no nations. I love this country. I consider myself a patriot. When 9-11 happened, I tried to sign up for the military. They said, okay, I, I volunteered for the JAG Corps, any of the three services that would have me. I, I, was re, you know, I was recruited actually to be an intelligence officer. I said, fine, wherever you want to put me, chaplain, intelligence officer, JAG Corps, I just want to serve. Our country's under attack. Let's go. And they said, okay, here are the physical requirements. You have to do this many push-ups, this many sit-ups, this many pull-ups, run this fast, all that kind of stuff. I said, okay. And so I started doing it. Went and got some jogging shoes, started working out. Uh, even though I was in law school and I had no time to do so, and I was doing it, and I was doing it. And one day, I was in my living room, I had my feet tucked under the couch, and I was doing sit-ups, and all of a sudden I looked down and something was sticking out of my gut. I said, what is that? And I tried to push it back in. And it popped back out. Push it back in. It popped back out. I go to the doctor. They said, you got a hernia? I said, that's for old people. They went, uh-huh. So I had to have surgery. And they put this mesh. Still got the scar right here. They put this mesh over the hernia. And I went back to the recruiters. And I said, I'm ready to go. They said, okay, we need your medical records. And about a week later, I got a phone call. I said, do you have a hernia? I said, yeah. Um, we can't take you. I said, but, 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 you know, JAG Corps, I'm going to be sitting at a desk, man. Sorry. They wouldn't take me. 
I tried. I'm a patriot. I love this country. But this country and all countries have an expiration date. When Jesus returns, there will be no America, there will be no England, there will be no Russia, there will be no China, there will be no Canada, who cares? Um, <laughs> what have they given us other than Tim Hortons? Um, I got a friend I podcast with sometimes in Canada, I tell him, I said, yeah, it's great for you to live in America's hat. Um, There'll be none of that. There'll be the kingdom of Jesus Christ, and that's it. That's it. So why are the nations coming to the church? Because our king, Jesus is our king, who rules and reigns, not later, but now, To ascend to the right hand of God is the place of power. To be at the right hand of the Father means you rule, you reign. He's there now. Get this out of your head that Jesus will reign one day. No, he reigns now. Matthew 28 does not say, all authority on heaven and earth will be given to me. It says all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Past tense. That's a king. Read Psalm 110. Read Isaiah 2. Read Psalm 72 over and over and over and over again. Jesus is king now. And he has commanded his people to do what? Stay away from sin? Yes. To grow in your faith? Yes. But it doesn't stop there. Do you go to church when you feel like it once every four to six weeks? Like you're doing God a favor? He commands the king of all creation commands not suggests not would appreciate it he commands that we as priests of the one true God go and make disciples of all nations and if we go and make disciples of all nations and truly live as Christ commanded us to live, then he says the nations themselves, the kings, the rulers of those nations will come to the church. To understand the wisdom of God. The problem that we have is several fold. The church... first of all, has a bad view of what we call the end times, the last days. They have a really bad understanding of what happens when you die. It is true that if you have faith in Jesus Christ, true faith, that you will go to heaven. You don't stay there. When Jesus returns to earth for the new heavens and new earth, you come with him. You do not spend an eternity sitting on a cloud, in a diaper, with a halo, playing a harp. That is the book of Tom and Jerry, not the Bible. That is not what the Bible teaches. If I die, and I wake up on a cloud, in a diaper, with a harp, I'm not in heaven, I'm in hell. That is not our destination. Our destination is here. 
Paul says that we will be made, when we see him, we will be made like him. What was he like when he was resurrected? Could they touch him? Didn't they? Could he eat? Didn't he? He says we were made like that. You've got to get that through your head. And you've got to get it through your head that, for some reason, Christians seem to think that engaging the world is sinful. How else are you going to make disciples of all nations? Part of it, I blame on your English translations. Now, generally speaking, your English translations, unless you're walking around with one you got from a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon, are pretty good. They get about 90% of it dead on correct. But they do screw up some things. Not all of them, but some of them. Even some of the better ones. The NIV does a really good job with the letters of Paul. With the Gospel of John, they suck. One of the things that it does in John, for example, in John 18, 36. Jesus is before Pilate. Now, Pilate doesn't want to deal with this. As best he can tell, this is just a, another rabbi. What does he care? So he begins to question him. And his questioning is basically in some, who are you? Are you one of these would-be messiahs that's going to cause me trouble and lead some kind of military rebellion? And most of your translations, if you have the NIV or even the New American Standard or the ESV or whatever, it has Jesus responding, my kingdom is not of this world. <clears throat> Thanks for playing. That's wrong. That is wrong. The little Greek word ek, little Greek word ek, can mean of, but typically means from, from. But the prejudices of the translators and also because no one wants to tick off the King James only people, is that we all go to heaven, we sit on a cloud, so therefore they translated it of. It's not of. Jesus says, my kingdom is not from this world. What he is saying to Pilate is, my authority and my power does not come from the number of people who are supporting me. It does not come from how many people are willing to take up arms. It does not come from here. My authority comes from the throne of heaven. But it is almost surely for this world. I know we're in election year, and I know that elections are important. They will make your life better or worse over the next two to four years. But it will not save you. No matter who wins in November, they will not save you. If you really want to see America, and then this world exponentially get better and better and better and better. If you want to see the kingdom of God, as Jesus said it would, slowly penetrate like leaven throughout. Spend less time watching 24-hour news cycles and more time studying your scripture, sharing the gospel, and helping people come to Christ. Because Jesus is almost certainly for this world. And quit sitting there and watching the news and think, if I hear this one more time, I'm on Facebook for like two minutes a day. That's all I can take. I see people on both sides. If such and such gets elected, it's going to be the apocalypse. No, if such and such gets elected, it's going to be the apocalypse. Give me a break. Huh. <sighs> 
bad. The world doesn't need more Republicans or Democrats. The world needs more faithful followers of Jesus Christ. That's what it needs. And if that, for that to happen, for that to truly happen, means not that somehow, some way, the spoiled brats at the Ivy League Law School are running around waving Hamas flags. And I, I get the irony that I'm wearing my alumni shirt from an Ivy League school where the brats are running around right now. To quote the classic movie Airplane, irony can be kind of ironic sometimes. Um, but to somehow think that look at that stuff or to look at the political campaign and people post on Facebook, things have never been worse. Are you kidding me? You're sitting in an air-conditioned room watching a flat-screen TV with a cup of coffee in your hand on your couch talking about how bad things are? Do you know what the people, our fellow Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ who were living under Nero and being dragged by horses and crucified and fed to lions and set a fire would do to trade places with us? It's not as bad as it could be. It's not as bad as it's ever been. It's not. My buddy Andrew Sandlin wrote a little book, and he wrote this. It's in your bulletin. I'll finish here in a second. He said, you got to keep this in mind. One, God has promised that the seed of Abraham will inherit the earth. Two, God has promised that Christ's kingdom will overwhelm the earth, this earth, not just the new heavens and new earth. Three, the New Testament teaches that Christ's enthronement, mentioned in Psalm 110.1, is instituted and fulfilled in the present. Four, God has promised that Christ's kingdom will advance gradually. If you want to be a part of that, if you really do want America to be great, if you really want the world to be great, it has to start with the church repenting. We need to repent here, get to know Christ and his ways well, follow the will of God, and then take it out there. The church has a mission, and this mission is a war. We fight against the principalities and powers of this world. And it's not, as John wrote, for the cowardly. But if we see ourselves, if we repent and truly have a vision of the one true God and the true king of the universe, and we see our mission clearly, we will stop sitting around in despair and sadness and anxiety, and we will get over what I call the Christian Eeyore syndrome and get to work. But you have a purpose that goes beyond just this life. You've got to see that this is God's world, and he does not want to cede an inch of it to Satan or anything else. Abraham Kuyper was right when he says God looks at the world and says every inch of it is mine. Christ is king. You are his servants. We are called to war. Let's go fight. I'll end this way, because I know I'm a few minutes over, preaching like dad now, the older I get. There is a British writer, long dead, who's worth reading, G.K. Chesterton. I love G.K. Chesterton. He was a witty Christian. His, back in the late 19th, early 20th century, his arch enemy was an atheist, bisexual, drug addicted alcoholic by the name of George Bernard Shaw, who was a noted and celebrated playwright. Shaw and Chesterton would trade arguments back and forth in the press. 
One time, Chesterton and his wife were at a, at a little party, and Shaw just happened to be there. And Chesterton had, was rather rotund. He had a big belly. And Bernard Shaw had had too much to drink, and he walked up to Chesterton and patted him on the belly and said, what are we going to name it? And Chesterton, without missing a beat, so I love Chesterton, he said, well, I love the Bible, so if it's a boy, I shall name it Joseph. If it's a girl, I shall name it Mary. But if it is, as I suspect, just a bad pe- ca- case of gas, I shall name it George Bernard Shaw. But Chesterton also said this, with all the horrible things that were happening in the world in his time, he reminded his fellow Christians, there's nothing better than to be part of a lost cause that cannot lose. Do you hear me? Just remember this. If you have the guts to take this up and take this into the world, to learn your faith, know your faith, and share your faith, you have the king of the cosmos, the creator of the universe, and the mighty Holy Spirit at your back. You cannot lose. Let's pray. Father God, we pray. We thank you for the vision of a new heavens and a new earth, the glorious future that you have promised. May your churches, especially in the West here, repent, turn from our selfishness, turn to you, see our lives. It's primarily about serving you, honoring you, glorifying you, worshiping you, and expanding your kingdom one disciple at a time. May we commit ourselves to this wholeheartedly so that we may stand in front of you one day and hear the words that many of us think too little of, though they will be the sweetest we ever hear. Well done, good and faithful servant. In Jesus' name, King Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. God bless you. God goes with you. Be praying for my presentation and that I get out of jury duty. Lord willing, see you next time. Christ Community meets on Saturday at 5 p.m. and Sunday at 10.30 a.m. For more information, visit www.christcommunity.net or check out our Facebook page.